Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are around the world. Thank you for joining us today for our current works conversation. I am Mario Gooden, president of the Architectural League, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our online version of current work featuring members of the experimental German collective Ramlaber Berlin as they discuss their subversive approach to architectural practice. Current work is a lecture series featuring leading figures in the world of architecture, urbanism, design, and art. The 2022-23 current work series examines projects and firms enacting new modes of architectural practice, collaboration, and community engagement. Upcoming, upcoming conversations in this series include All Zone, uh, led by Rachel Korn uh, Chahui, coming up on March 21st, which will also take place online followed by 51N4E from Brussels in April uh, that will be in person in the Great Hall at Cooper Union on April 11th, and Athalena Initiative from Cairo, which will also take place online on May 2nd. Also, uh, be on the lookout for our Emerging Voices uh, series with this year's winners, beginning on March 9th with Common Works and Catherine Hogan Architects. The Common uh, the current work series is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the New York City Council and by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature. Current work is co-sponsored by the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture at the Cooper Union, and we thank the Cooper Union for their partnership. The Architectural League Additionally, thanks its members whose support helps make this and other programs possible. So now, let me introduce today's moderator and my colleague, Mark Wigley. Mark Wigley is Professor of Architecture and Dean Emeritus of the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at Columbia GSAP. He's a historian, theorist, and critic who explores the intersection of art, architecture, philosophy, culture, and technology. He received both his Bachelor of Architecture and his PhD from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. He has curated exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Drawing Center in New York, Columbia University, Bitter de Witt uh, Center for Contemporary Art, Hetanoia Institute, the Canadian Center for Architecture, and the Power Station of Art. He was the co-curator for the third Istanbul uh, Biennial in 2016 with Beatrice Colomina, the curator of the Human Insect Antennas 1886-2017 at the Hetnoya Institute in Rotterdam in 2018, and uh, passing through architecture 10 years of Gordon Matta Clark at the Power Station of Art in Shanghai in 2019 and 2020. Uh, let's just say that Mark's articles and books are too numerous to rehearse here, and I'm sure that you all are very familiar with a number of them. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Mark Wigley, who will introduce our guest for today. Hi, Mark. Hi. Thanks a lot, Mario. Um, I, I just a few words, because obviously, um, Benjamin and Jan are going to describe their work to you. So why would I tell you beforehand what their work is about? Um, but maybe just to give a little context, because obviously, we're all gathered together to think about what might happen to the species of architect like whether the species can survive or not in it, as part of this series. And Benjamin and Jan are, are two of the nine members of Realm Labor. It obviously, is a collaborative formed in 1999. So you could almost say a kind of 20, 21st century experiment with what might happen to the architectural species. And even if I say it's a collaboration of nine, if you really would draw some sort of diagram of this studio, sometimes the members of the nine work together in different projects and different combinations Never work alone. So if you actually draw a kind of spider's web uh, map of what's going on with Realm Labor, it would become some, like some kind of science fiction movie where this seemingly happy, friendly uh, group of nine, um, more or less, you know, gravitating around Berlin, actually are at the center of a kind of a spider's web of projects and collaborations and modes of thinking and exhibition that is in a certain sense uh, uh, global. So my only thing to say by way of introduction is to issue you a warning. Uh, everything here seems small, local, sensitive, um, 
non-extractive, uh, temporary, uh, and positioned somewhere between architecture and planning and public art. But perhaps uh, the reason that we're all gathered together is that this work is in no way small, in no way local, involves all sorts of complicated relationships to energy, is not at all temporary, is somehow lingering uh, and redefining. So I think it's, a, it, it's um, um, very exciting to hear what um, Benjamin and Jan would say. And I have to say, like in truth and advertising, that spider's web that I described, somehow I'm inside that web because there is kind of, um, it's always very exciting to be in an opportunity to participate and collaborate with this new way of thinking. And I've been lucky to do that several times. So uh, without further ado, I just want to hand you over to um, Benjamin and Jan. My only words of introduction are to say, um, this is a non-boring operation. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for the very nice words. Um, that um, I hope that everything went well today with your becoming an American. Uh, well, now you're gone. We can talk about that later. Um, we are Raumlabor here. Uh, we're in Berlin. In Berlin, it's dark already. Uh, it's not morning like in your place. Um, the office behind me that I decorated nicely for you is quite empty already. There's just one person left and she will also leave. And Jan is not here because he's been sick the last days and uh, he's sitting in his apartment. But you can see him in the little window above and uh, he will appear later. Maybe, you, maybe Jan wants to say hello. Yeah, hello everybody and uh, really nice you're joining this lecture and yeah, I hope we're gonna have a really interesting discussion uh, afterwards if you're able to stay. Okay, so here comes the lecture called, wait a minute, um, Working on Common Ground. And Oh, I cannot see the button, here it is. Here it is. So that's the name of the lecture, Common Ground, Working on Common Ground. Common Ground is, is, is a title that, that's been used a lot. Uh, I've just listened to uh, an interesting conversation between Mark Wigley and Peter Eisenman when Peter came back from uh, the Venice Biennial by David Chipperfield that was also called Common Ground. Uh, and they were elaborating quite interestingly about that term. Um, when we say working on common ground, we mean something like that. Um, we are nine people working together as partners in Raum Labor. And we have lots of others that collaborate with us, not only here in this office, but also in other places uh, where we come together. And, um, and we, we, are, we have a common ground already. Maybe in this image, it's not so obvious because we are obviously standing almost knee deep in some kind of muddy waters. But um, our common ground is as follows. We live in the same city. We are all architects. We are all more or less the same age, you could see. We share an office, the one behind me, and uh, a website, and we all like to cook. And we share many interests. That's very helpful. We like to build spaces of encounter. We also like to be part of these as well. We like temporary structures for many reasons. They can be built easily and in groups and with different skills. Temporary structures can be can be very small and provocative, and they show that architecture is performative as well, always. 
We like to surprise the city and use the unexpected to start dialogues, discussions, and urban processes. When we make an intervention, it is always part of a transformation process that has started before and will go on after. Cities, oh, that's New York City. I just found this book in our shelf, A Guide to New York City. That's, I think, 40 years old. I was just going through it when the music stopped. Anyways, we've been in your city as well. Cities are transforming mostly faster than we wish. And societies are transforming as well. And we can become part of that. And we can decide how we want to influence, contaminate, pollinate the process of transformation. We enjoy talking about resources. We think that architecture should have done so for a longer time. And we think that the result of leaving the comfort zone must not be boring at all. We think that architecture can be just consisting of a word on the hill and that the office of the architect should be a public place where ideas are produced together and buildings are conceived and built together as well. We think buildings today need a lot of urgency to justify to be built. And this urgency is not produced by the market. Buildings need to be sustainable to sustain their existence. They need to be resourceful and help us to support each other. That's why we like open structures without doors for small encounters and for large encounters as well. We develop these tools and activators for public space, and we create these sets of building elements that can be assembled in many different ways and disassembled as well. And we build with resources that can be found on the street. We think it's necessary to stay with the trouble that we produce. And here we come to the more free part of the lecture, the four projects that we want to present. The floating university, staying with the trouble is the right subject here, I think. The uh, floating university is a project that we started in Berlin in 2018, and it's still going on today, and we hope that it will be going on for a while. Even though it is located in a very strange place. The floating university is the blue area in the middle of this image. It's surrounded by a ring of allotment gardens that surrounded. Let me see if you can see my cursor. No, my cursor is not visible. Uh, that's surrounded by a couple of sports fields that are surrounded by cemeteries that are surrounded by the city of Berlin. And it is situated right beside the Temple of Airport, which is that half moon shaped building on the left side. The, Floating University is, um, so it's, it's, it's neighbor to this app, what used to be an airport, which is now Berlin's largest park area. It's an open, open area that is um, public and publicly usable and is very, very attractive. If you've ever been to Berlin or if you ever come to Berlin, you should definitely come and see the Temple of Airfield because it's the only place in the city where you can see the horizon and where you can basically do whatever you want. Um, we have tried to support this whole process from the beginning of closing down the airport and opening it up to the public and also we're helping to find 
new forms of interesting program that can be happening there. Um, but we were also a bit scared that the city of Berlin would um, start building here and, and use it as real estate development area. That's why at a certain point, we decided to, um, to organize an event that we called the Big World Fair. That was in 2012. And the Big World Fair was consisting of a couple of um, pavilions that were designed for artists that basically showed that the world is not fair. And um, they, were, they were dealing with their own like personal perspective on, on the world and displayed that. And one of these pavilions was this pavilion by our friend Eric Gönrich. It was called the Pavilion of the World Fairs. And he was dealing actually with the history of the World Fairs. And together with them, with him, we made this huge panoramic drawing of all the exciting architectures that have been invented in the history of the uh, of the World Fairs. That is now like almost 150 year old history. And if we think of it, we can all remember that this is the drawing in nice, you know. And we've situated all these buildings on the Temple of Airfield. So you see everything from the from the Tour Eiffel on the left side. And then there's also a very small in front of the Tour Eiffel, you can see the New York World, World Fair from when was it? 56, I think. You see all the Ferris wheels from all the World Fairs. And if you go to the far right, you can also see the Crystal Palace. And in the back, you see the, uh, the, uh, the Osaka World Fair Central Building. Uh, where is it? Uh, it's not here anymore. But this is the corner where the now we find the floating university. Now this is what that was 2012. And we started the floating university in 2018. But what you see here in that little circle uh, circular ring uh, in the center of the image uh, is a structure in the center of this rainwater basin where you find today the floating university. And this is where we at that time decided that the Raumlabor headquarters will be to organize this huge uh, World Fair uh, assembly. Now, the uh, the the site itself is uh, the collector for stormwater when uh, on the when when, it, when when there's strong rain, and it collects all the water that is uh, falling on the sealed areas of the of the airport, so all the runways and the, uh, the taxiways and also the field in front of the building, and all this water when it when it rains a lot comes into this basin. As I said, it's surrounded by the city and, uh, and sports fields and cemeteries and also a ring of allotment gardens that um, were well hiding this kind of eight meter deep hole uh, in the middle of the city. So actually nobody really knew that it was there beside the allotment gardeners. And uh, so when we opened up this marvelous site, um, uh, for five years ago, um, it was really something new for the city, even though it was five minutes from the subway and in, in the center. So we, we were hesitating for a while if we, we really should start doing something here or if we should keep it as a secret to the city. But with the closing down of the, uh, of the airport and the opening of the park, the pressure of the market, of the real estate market, became so strong in, in Berlin and especially in these areas around the former airport that um, we thought it's only uh, a matter of time until the truffle pigs of the market will find this beautiful spot, start proposing to the city to build uh, loft apartment blocks here. So we thought we better get a foot in the door. And this... This is what the foot looked like. So we made a drawing and said, this is what, what we're going to do here. Um, it is something in between a water purification plant. It's a, it's a thing where we 
deal a bit with water as a resource, rainwater, you know, all this discourse about Swamp City. And we include all the universities of the city uh, into this discourse. And not only of the city, but we'll invite the whole academic world to come together here to have a transdisciplinary discourse about cities and transformation. And, um, and uh, don't you want to give this public infrastructure uh, to us for a while, let's say for a year, um, and also give us some money to actually build this. And uh, uh, I admit it was a crazy idea, but, um, but if, you, um, if you know how these things work, uh, then you, and you find out who are the right people to talk to, then maybe at some point you manage to, uh, to get the funds and to persuade the right people at the right spots. For us, it took about three years. And then finally, we, um, we managed. We had the key and we had some public funding to build this. And then we just needed you know, to actually build it was the easiest thing. And also to make a program there was super easy because we have all these friends like Mark, uh, like uh, uh, um, uh, other people teaching at the at all kinds of universities around Berlin and around Germany and in Europe that were actually waiting for a place where we can all meet and discuss all these pressing topics that are in the air. So, um, and here it was this beautiful site in the middle of the city in a mostly dry rainwater basin. Uh, we installed a kitchen, an auditorium, uh, that you can see here, and uh, that had a pool in the middle. And we um, initiated a program for one year where uh, groups of students with their teachers, and sometimes also groups of students without teachers, and sometimes also teachers without groups of students, would come uh, and make workshops and hold lectures and have discussions and build new facilities that. Uh, that, that can be used by other people. And we tried also to make um, all kinds of different um, uh, cultural formats that would um, invite the neighborhood and the rest of the city and everyone in so that we can come into a discourse about the way that uh, we, have, we all have to react to the transformation of the city and how we have to um, change our everyday life. So uh, one important aspect that I just want to mention is the kids' university um, that we that we've started and it's 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 still running. It's a collaboration that we started with just you know kids that randomly came and now it's a big collaboration with lots of schools and other um, institutions that come together in this place and uh, and and actually and here we are back with staying with the trouble. What you see here is rainwater that um, the city of Berlin is just collecting here and then giving back to the river. But in, this, in, the, in the distance from where the rainwater fell down on the ground until it comes to the river, it becomes highly polluted. And what you see here is actually polluted rainwater, um, which is not so bad. I mean, it's easy to tell the kids not to drink it. It looks awful anyways. Uh, but um, but the kids can see that there is something wrong. And then we have them starting to wander around and find out what is wrong with this place. Um, and they, they find out that even though there might be something wrong, there's still animals living here. And they find these traces of animals um, and they detect them and they start to tell stories. And we build these kind of filtration, experimental filtration, um setups where we try to um where we try to filter the water uh this is a more um experienced version of it that you can still see if you come today it's a, a moving bed reactor that actually filters all the water to um to uh, bathing water quality uh we have a toilet that is working with rainwater where you fill up your bucket with water and you take it to the toilet to flush and uh, and we are in this place that when it when it rains it gets flooded, uh, which for us is always a big 
exciting event. It's a bit like when you come to Venice and there's Aqua Alta. It's also very exciting. And uh, so you have to put on these rubber boots that go up to your belly button and, uh, and then you can walk around there. Um, so what, what we've been doing there in the past years was like constantly trying to, um, to make new networks, invite new people, find new formats, um, and, um, and of course also find new monies. We also found, found new architectures, like you can see here, the change from here to there is four years. This is what it looks like. And we build up a huge um, association because after the first year, um, we as an architect's office collective decided that it cannot be our responsibility anymore to run this, uh, to run this place, but it needs an entity like an association that, um, that also invites other people to take responsibility. So after the first year, we founded uh, the floating association and uh, the floating association now has something around 60 members, 30 of them are really active and uh, taking care of the different parts of, of the program and, and, uh, and, and the site and, uh, and getting the money and making public relation and so on. And, uh, and also changing what it looks like. This was in the second year. Um, so we have you know, all also adapting a bit the architecture to what, uh, to the budget that we have and the amount of people that we have. And also if there's a, a pandemic coming, maybe we have to expand our space. That was actually the best, um, uh, the best time for the floating university because we were the only uh, the only cultural venue in the whole city of Berlin that could immediately be started because we were outside and we had all, everything organized there. Uh, people keep distance and keep their mask on. And there was an entrance where we could also check if they were vaccinated and so on and so on. So um, we, uh, we were able to go on where all the cinemas and all the theaters and all the museums had to close down. So this is what it looks like now. Uh, of course, I don't want to um, I don't want to hide from you that we also have other forms of trouble um, than just all the contamination and the not resourcefulness of the city. Uh, but we also are fighting a lot with the administration. That's why at the moment we have um, we have these signs uh, put up, and uh, as you can see, there's also not anymore this nice green muddy place because uh, the city has decided that uh, now that it's public it needs to be cleaned up <laughs> so uh, every every now and then they're coming in with uh, with cleaning machines and uh, they also told us that we are not allowed to walk around in the water anymore um, because uh, we are um, endangering the the other species that live there uh, the amphibia, the frogs, and uh, the insects, I guess. Um, and we're, uh, so we, we have opened up a new field of negotiation also with the administration and with the other people responsible. And uh, we are trying to also talk with the frogs what they like and, uh, and if, we, if we have any results on that side, I can tell you. That was the first project. Jan, do you have the do you have the time? How much time do I have for this one now to have to give you enough time for your part? I think six minutes uh, when uh, when I'm right, but I think you're okay. You're doing doing good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. So I, I, this is a completely different story. We were invited to the city of Pristina while the the big large biennial called Manifesta was happening there. Pristina is in Kosovo, Kosovo is a non-existing nation. Um, it is existing for some countries. Uh, some nations have accepted Kosovo, others haven't. United States and Germany are among the ones who have accepted Kosovo as a, as a nation. But there's also some of the states in, uh, in, in, in Europe who haven't, and of course, uh, Serbia hasn't and Russia hasn't as well. So um, we are uh, in a small country that is 
also for European standards is quite small. And Pristina is the, um, the capital. Um, Pristina was the place where in the last year, the, the biennial called Manifesta was happening. And Manifesta is a huge traveling uh, biennial that is every second year in another city. So it was a big thing for Pristina to host uh, the Manifesta. And uh, this is, it's a bad Google image of uh, Pristina, but just to show you um, that uh, to walk from the center, now you cannot see my cursor again, but the center is somewhere in the middle uh, to the outskirts is about 10 minutes. So Pristina is not a very big city, but um, it is uh, quite chaotic, as you can see on the site. This is the site that we were asked to work on because the, the, the manifesto was happening on in 20 different sites around the city. And one was a very, very big site um, that, is, that is called the Brick Factory. It's a former brick factory that is not working anymore. Uh, you can see maybe on this uh, image, you see the stadium. And then on the right side of the stadium, you have the, uh, you have this, the, the central shopping area. And then above there, uh, on, the, on the top of the building, you have a, uh, of, of the image, you have a big site um, that, is, uh, that is the brick factory. And if you walk from the stadium to the brick factory, it's five minutes, so it's not very far away. Um, it's a central place and it, uh, you can see it here marked by the two chimneys uh, that are sticking out. And here you have an image of the city of Pristina lying a little valley. And what, what you can see on, wait a minute, I go to this, back to this one. Everything that is red, uh, every building that has like brownish red here is supposedly built with bricks from this brick factory. Everything that's gray has been built later. Now, uh, sorry, um, there, there is a, kind of a change in the, in the culture of building uh, in Pristina uh, that is moving from bricks to concrete, um, which is sad in one way because the brick factory was a very interesting site, had a lot of workers and has a lot of history uh, connected to the city. Um, and concrete, as we all know, is also is, is very problematic in, a, in terms of climate, but maybe we talk about that later, Mark. Um, now the brick factory has been closed down for 20 years and um, has been transformed into, um, um, how, do, how do I say that? It's, it looks like a garbage dump, but actually it's a business. Um, uh, the whole uh, brick factory was when we arrived there in winter about a year ago. Um, looked like this. Uh, and we were asked if we could make something here that is a bit like the Floating University, a bit um, a nature, culture, learning place. Uh, and we looked at this and we were a bit puzzled how to manage that. Um, then, uh, you know, buildings looked like that and was all, uh, all a bit falling apart. But uh, we didn't know at that time that, uh, that the mayor of the city and the city itself and the whole organization of the Manifesta were fully behind us and helped us to actually clean up this place. And this is um, uh, uh, not very long later. So uh, let's say this image was in May and this is in June. So uh, the, the city came in with, the, um, with a lot of, um, hands and, and companies to clean up the place. The, the dark side of it is that also the businesses had to move somewhere else that were there. I was not so fond of that, but Jan thought it was okay. And I think uh, maybe he's not so wrong with saying that maybe a, uh, a recycling business uh, has to be also thought in a, in a different way and it was uh, exercised there uh, before. So what we did was basically we came into this place and tried to imagine um, what this site could be in the future. The city has bought the whole factory um, about a year ago. 
uh, with the intention to install a, some kind of a cultural center, maybe a museum, maybe a contemporary art center, maybe uh, atelier spaces, maybe something else that we don't know. So there was a lot of agenda that we that we didn't that we weren't so sure of. But culture that was clear. So what we thought was everything that we can do coming in as a collective of architects is we can come in with our energy and we come can come with our ideas and we can facilitate a space where a common ground is being developed and and in this we're quite good we know what is needed to start a process and uh, one very essential thing is that you need something to sit on so to have something to sit on and build a chair uh, that you can put your, um, your body in a different position, you need a workshop. So one of the first things that we did was we installed a workshop and, uh, and then we started building chairs. And then we found some elements on site like this bench that we found quite attractive and started to copy the existing uh, the existing interior architecture and kind of tuned it up a bit so that it's not so wobbly wiggly <laughs> and uh, and uh, and started a mass production of benches as well um, to to be able to uh, to actually do this and also because we thought it's 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 a super interesting process, we decided that we will um, that we will make a big learning situation. So we um, we announced a summer school in an open call where uh, students actually from around Europe, but especially also from Kosovo and Pristina, could apply to be part of, and uh, and it was a big big interest. So we had um, we had a, a summer school with I don't remember the exact number, Jan, thirty students. That forty. Uh, I think it was thirty-eight. Ah, okay. So almost forty students that um, that uh, came for two weeks to develop together with us uh, a new new forms of architecture to uh, to. Um, give space and give home to this space of negotiation for the future of the site. One of the things that uh, was done was uh, not only cleaning up, but also using the material that we found there, these bricks uh, that you see here, and try to, um, to upgrade them and upcycle them in a way that they can be used. So what you see here is a process of building an oven to glaze the existing bricks from the brick factory that were also produced in the brick factory. Um, we invited a collective. Uh, we, we ourselves, we have no idea how to make um, a, a glazing oven, oven. So we invited a collective from Berlin to, uh, to come along and give this workshop. And for two weeks, they were working on different uh, uh, burning and glazing uh, exercises and experiments and finally uh, build this kitchen so what you see here is a is a rocket stove on the left side and a huge kitchen table with glazed new bricks as a buffet in the middle and also um, a basin in the back um, in the in the summer school we had five different workshops just to name some some one one of them was uh, was to build like different features that are actually needed. Like for example, a bar. Uh, a bar of course is very important if you want to, uh, if you want to have a cozy place to, uh, to, to meet. Uh, another workshop was to, um, to start and talk with the people that have some memory of the brick factory as a brick factory. And what you see here is a gathering of former workers from the brick factory. So students were meeting up with people from the neighborhood, but also with former workers and try to map the history of the place. And this map of the history became a, a huge mural that, uh, that you could find on one of the walls in the, um, looked like this. 
and also a little booklet that would tell all the stories of the place. So when there's a bigger transformation coming that there is a kind of um, um, a handful of material that, uh, that decisions can be based on that is rooted uh, back in the history in the probably 60, 70 year old history of the site. And, and the other side to it is looking a bit into the future and finding and proposing new forms of, um, of energy production. We have invited um, the collective Stealth from Rotterdam and Belgrade to work with the students on, um, on new, new ideas or how energy could be, could be produced here. And they made different experiments and also uh, calculated the amount of roof surface that is there and how much um, how much solar energy could be produced only putting solar panels on these roofs and other forms that were that were calculated. We also had a big auditorium in the middle where um, other forms of public events could be held and uh, and we build something that is a bit more attractive also for the young people in the neighborhood. And that was a pool that is um, actually still there and it's still usable um, if they put water back in <laughs> and uh, when it's getting warm. Um, and this, uh, uh, this pool is designed in a way that it can also be a parliament or a place where people can sit together. The form of the pool is the form of an oda. Oda is uh, is uh, uh, in this in this Balkan area, especially, and also in other cultures. You have these square rooms with a bench that is going all around, where people can come together. And our oda here is um, is filled with water, just to show that maybe there's something else to be talked about than uh, than just um, just uh, what makes sense for the people. That, have uh, a bit more power than the others. And, uh, and here's a drawing that we've uh, produced after, uh, after the summer school was over with all the ideas and all the, all the um, um, things that have come up or the, or the possible futures of the site uh, brought together in one drawing. And uh, here I give the word to Jan. Um, I will just very quickly turn off my screen and Jan will turn on his screen. So that okay, he can... thanks a lot. I hope we have a smooth transition here and uh, I hope I can uh, yeah, keep this in a good timing. Um, yeah, I want to tell you about two projects that are kind of trying to scale up some of the strategies that uh, Benny was uh, already talking about. And um, one is situated in the harbor area in, uh, uh, in uh, Sweden, in, in the city of Göteborg. And it's a quite central area. It has been the free harbor. And uh, the city is uh, for some years now, oh, wait, I have to. Oh yeah, no, I can, I can. Uh, the city is for some years now um, developing the the whole um, backside, the, the wrong side of the river, so to say, the side that is opposite the inner city where mostly harbor activities were and where also a lot of the social housing projects are situated and a lot of the businesses. And this uh, is called the river project and the last part almost or the, the most central part of this river project is now the development of this inner harbor and as you see here on these images it's not a very kind of harbor like harbor but it's mostly asphalt and concrete and there's not so much left from the cranes and the romantics of the harbor but there's still the use of boats and when we were invited the city had started to kind of change their city development strategy and they wanted to make this new neighborhood a new neighborhood really like a more mixed neighborhood than the other neighborhoods that they had 
developed along the river before, which ended up mostly being either commercial or like middle class, very expensive housing. So for this last like three peers, they want to really develop a dense inner city. And they also want to install a park that they call the Jubilee Park that opens actually this year in June for the 400th university of the city of Göteborg. And for this, they have to put a lot of new infrastructure. You see here, they're building a new bridge. There's new subway lines. There was already new bus lines installed. And yeah, there's the plan for a kind of massive densification around this uh, bridge uh, and then a kind of lower densification out into the river. And here's some, the, the plan is changing all the time. So this is just some kind of a bit random visualizations of the future of this place. And uh, here's uh, a more kind of solid uh, plan where you see that the park uh, has already moved. It's now quite in the center of the development. In the first plans, it was supposed to be very much on the tip of this piers. And we've been invited there uh, or five years ago uh, by two curators that have been um, hired by the city-owned development company. And they were hired to kind of develop a kind of alternative idea about the park. And uh, what they said that they want to do, they asked for a budget and they said that they want this kind of the, the city wanted really participation. They wanted to include in the, the adjacent neighborhoods and, and, and they brought up this uh, slogan of uh, show me, don't tell me. And they found that to bring people to such a place that has been always closed because it was a free harbor. It was not, uh, it was totally fenced in. Um, yeah, you need to first bring some activity. So that what they did in the very first year, they already had invited some other artists before us and architects and have started to put on these vast fields of asphalt um, artistic installations and programs. And one program, for example, is uh, by MAF Architects. It's, uh, it's a kind of roller coaster where you can roller skate. There was this big... Uh, artwork by a Dutch uh, artist uh, couple. Um, and then they invited us and they invited us with the topic of basing culture. And it was a very funny invitation because it came in the summer and we were not taking it so seriously. Uh, and so we, we, we were invited there uh, to build something around basing culture and um, and for us, it was first, it was a very uh, kind of strange side to even think about basing. So the first thing that we very often do in this bigger urban project is that we make a kind of mapping. And so we asked them if they would give us also a bit of kind of planning budget to make this mapping uh, of what kind of activities are already there. And this was partly commercial activities that were still there and are now slowly moving out like these big holes here in the background. But we also found that there were a lot of people already using this place. There was a sailing school, um, there was urban gardening, there were people just coming by to do this kind of strange sailing activities on wheels. There were... Um, the other art installations and we started to do a mapping and then we found that somehow we have to fit ourselves with this basing culture into this landscape but uh, the landscape mostly looked like that when we arrived so what was our doubt at this time is that would this really be as a park accepted by the general public or would this just become a kind of hipster place so we very much from the beginning thought strategically to build something that is a bit of an icon or something and we also asked them if we could build on the water which then first was not possible because they didn't they had still rented out these piers in the water and they also had still rented out this piece of land that you see here um, which we then try to make into a, uh, a park and Yes, this was one of the images that we found is from somewhere in Sweden, and we really very much like this kind of basing 
as a as a kind of place where a place of encounter where you you hang out you have like this almost like no commercial activity around everybody is in bathing suits everybody's the same i mean for us it was it's really like the most democratic thing to do um and so in the beginning they asked us if we could do uh a steam bus because this was kind of a by a kind of research i found that many people wanted maybe a steam bus but we found that this was very complicated um so we kind of um situated us in this situation and this is a first overview where you already see the final plan but here you just that you get to know that all this, I mean, this housing here is just fiction by us, but this is a kind of border of where the housing is going to come. Uh, so we also uh, had to always keep in mind that this is going to be a very busy park. Uh, this is now a kind of destination and some people from the neighborhood come there and it's already very popular. But once this 10,000 people are going to move there, it's going to be a, a very, very used and very popular place. Um, and in the beginning, this was all supposed to be just for uh, maybe a, a time of up to up to three years. So we directly said that we would, in, in this kind of time frame, be very concerned about using boring stuff, using existing stuff so we started to make a big research uh, on city-owned uh, construction uh, departments and found a lot of material that we could use and we actually started the planning and the building almost in the same time because we went there was a team of 10 collaborators of us two or three partners and uh, another seven and we invited also people from Göteborg to yeah, just to get to know the city and to get familiar with the place. And we started to to build this bus. And um, there was basically uh, only very few tectonic ideas or architectonic ideas. Once to build a sauna that you already see here in the background as a kind of icon. Once this idea of um, a floating wood that always comes here and especially in the winter when there's a, there's a very tidal condition on this river this is very close to the to the seaside so there's salt water coming in pressing in and brings all this kind of drifting wood so this was our our kind of design idea was to make this kind of drifting park uh, and everything on land would be very much in this kind of um moment and and then to um and then then to contrast that with this um the strange building on the pier which became the sauna and we tried to in this process uh, to involve as much also people in the building process so here we build with uh bottles uh, that were new bottles but they couldn't be used because they don't fit the european norms so we got them for free and we built this showers and changing rooms uh, then mostly by recycled materials and we did this yeah i think they are the most amazing showers actually uh, where the light comes through this double layer of bottles yeah, but the main feature uh, was the sauna, the place where you could hang out, where you could meet, and the place where you actually could feel you sit naked in a room and you feel the proximity to the inner city. Where, where Because for Göteborg people that lived on the other side of the river, this was still kind of far away, even so it's just one stop from the main station. So mentally, it was still far away. So here you see in the process, um, our, one of our collaborators testing the view from the sauna onto the city center. And then we were resourcing this uh, corrugated steel and different uh, vast uh, um, industrial sites. And we had to go there and harvest it ourselves. We were sorting it out. We were then applying this to this kind of strange sculpture and became this sauna tower that then also, and part by part, like the reality came in and we found out that they also wanted an elevator to make it accessible for handicaps and the whole structure became more and more 
like a serious architecture. And more and more, we believe that it would also stay much longer than the three years planned. Here you see the inside. Uh, the inside intentionally we made into this kind of beautiful breathing space so that you would really go there and get the very kind of physical and personal relation to the space and the whole surrounding and the park and you would maybe start to become interested in doing things there and be engaged as a citizen into this new city development. And yes, through this kind of success of this uh, kind of sauna, we then also got the second commission in a small competition to build a swimming pool. Uh, this was not built by ourselves, but it was a very fast collaboration with a steel company that we applied with. And it was built and planned in only uh, six months. And here you see also that we, we were a bit tired of designing, so we just used this idea of displacement and we used this old ship steering houses that were very easy and cheap to buy because many ships uh, get uh, yeah kind of demolished and then these steering houses are kind of available resources and they're very good in this weather conditions and we built this swimming pool and it's a pool with a natural um we we then found a german company Polyplan that is doing natural pools. So we collaborated with them and they built a natural cleaning plant on the land. So it's a natural pool where the the, the water is filtrated to a kind of sand and um, sand and plants filter. And this was then running for some years. It became very popular and the city plan continued and there was a need to yeah, built. Then there was a competition for the park, uh, won by a German also um, landscape design uh, company um, called Atelier Le Balto, and we also collaborated with them. And then we made the plan because the whole ground there was contaminated. The buildings that we have done had to be taken away and only could partly be reduced, reused, and the sauna. Uh, luckily could stay because it was out on the on the water so they asked us to uh, plan uh, um, yeah, a long-term structure and to extend this pool uh, a lot and so what we did then is we included the existing pool you see it here uh, it's now the one pointing to the to the to the sauna and we made a long real swimming pool and uh, another kids pool um, and a big jumping pool in this spiral that you see uh, on the bottom of the image. And there was a nice invention. Uh, there was a Swedish uh, a maritime engineer. She had this idea that we could use that because the river is polluted in Göteborg, the river water, but the uh, underwater, which is salt water, is seawater, which is clean. So she said that about on six meter below water level, uh, you have totally clean water. And we made a two years test with a pool and we pumped up this water and it was actually always clean and it wasn't mixing because the salt water is uh, a bit more heavy than the sweet water and so this idea arose to make a pool that is just a hanging curtain in the river uh, and now we have these uh, two big pools uh, the long swimming pool and the jumping pool and they're both kind of just uh, curtains that separate the sweet water from the salt water and the, the salt water is just pumped up with very small six very small pumps uh, on, onto the surface so that you can actually swim in the river in the river water but uh, in salt water in clean salt water and I think this has actually never been done before and we are still a bit curious if it, if it works it is under construction now also here you see some images from the then new built um 
changing rooms, there had to be much bigger, there had to be staff rooms, there had to be proper heating. They didn't allow us to do the bottle facades again for they had a lot of concerns, even so they were working very well. So we designed a new facade with, uh, yeah, here you, you see with this kind of wooden sticks, we designed a, a colored wooden facade with this double grid. And here you see some very recent images. Uh, it was in the winter, it's very rainy, not the beautiful day uh, from this, uh, new changing room buildings and also some images from, from the, the new basing facility on the construction. And yeah, what is interesting in this project, it is, I, I, well, you could really call it a, a top-down, bottom-up project because the city of Göteborg really decided to uh, start this process. They invited a lot of people and they were basically the initiators to create this new neighborhood in a more kind of participative way. It is kind of funny or strange or maybe also sad that the whole kind of commercial development is very much behind. They have difficulties to sell the land on the prices that they need to a race to to get the infrastructure in place or to pay back for the infrastructure so in the in, in it's now in a funny condition that we are actually now opened in this park but all the kind of uh, buildings around have not been started yet and the last project should i still do this benny or we are five minutes five minutes after um, I'm not sure how we're in the timing. Um, Five maybe... minutes after one. <laughs> maybe I just from, give a very. I just give a very brief uh, introduction to this last project, which is again a kind of scale up, maybe of this uh bottom-up strategies that we have developed over the last 20 years and this is a site in the city center of berlin right at alexanderplatz here you see the tv tower for the ones who've ever been in berlin you probably all have been to this place it's a former governmental building uh, it was the national office of statistics in the ddr so a very central place because it was also a planning office for the five years plans in the socialist economy and in the 90s there was a whole yeah new plan for the inner city and also a big competition on uh, alexanderplatz and here you see this is a plan urban plan by Kolov with this kind of high rises that are sticking in blocks uh, and here you see also on this corner there was supposed to be everything was supposed to be demolished and uh, a big high rise was supposed to be built and uh, in 2015, when we also had this big uh, income of, um, of, of, of res refugees from Syria, um, there was a big need of, for space in, in many ways in the city. And uh, at this moment, this building was empty for 20 years. And there was an initiative of different artists uh, that put up a poster on this building that was supposed to be demolished. And uh, the poster said that the city would actually provide space here for art, culture, and uh, social initiatives. And this was a kind of fake poster, but it led to a kind of uh, a movement uh, within the, within the public, the civic society, but also within the local politics that started to rethink if the demolishing of this huge complex, which is houses 45,000 square meter, is really still reasonable and if there's not other ways. And then it actually happened that the whole development plan get changed and the city of Berlin, the country bought from the national government this land, this former administration. And uh, on the same time, the the kind of civic society got organized and they funded a new initiative um, for, for um, the house the statistic, which is the you know, house the statistic initiative. And, and, and with a lot of 
lobbying and a lot of uh, um, yeah, self-organization and self-empowerment, it was then possible to uh, really get a collaboration set and fund a, a kind of uh, people-owned uh, cooperative housing association in 2016. And uh, after a lot of lobbying, uh, get access to the site and start an agreement about the development of the site with together with the city and its different agencies. And this is maybe where this is different from many other projects that have been involved in, that this is really trying to cooperate and build trust between the civic society and so-called like bottom-up players and this huge uh, municipal administrations. So it's a city government, it's a district government, it's a municipal real estate management and the municipal housing company. And they decided together to develop this huge inner city area for the common good, so to say, and to agree on all the decisions within the development process in a, in a kind of legal agreement. And yeah, I'm not going to bother you with this, but you can imagine that's a huge, uh, that this is a huge, um, a, um, difficult process and timeline. And yeah, and, and here we, we are kind of involved as architects, more as developers, uh, people that negotiate and make uh processes possible make processes visible steer the process invite for architectural competitions and uh, work together with the other administrations organize a pioneer phase of use where different programs and actors are invited to be the future users of this site and uh, there was also big events hey, yeah, yeah and i don't i don't want to be the grim reaper but um I was thinking the problem is you're never going to be really able to explain the project, right? Or if you do, we don't have a conversation. So I think you okay, have to decide yeah. uh, what you want. I'm a bit speaking as a lawyer on behalf of the audience because maybe they want to ask questions and stuff. Yeah, no, I think that's totally right. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, yeah, no. Actually, I think, I think it's, it's kind of great for the audience yeah, and me to be yeah, frustrated, you know? Yeah. No, it's fantastic. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I, I think it's also... It's, it's enough to get an impression uh, that it's, it's, yeah. I, we just wanted to show this that to show that these kind of bottom up initiatives, they start now to lead into much bigger political and city development movement and that there's maybe a possibility for a kind of cooperative city development as a kind of step out of this many crises that we are facing. And this is already the last slide. Ah. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for, and I will stop sharing now. Thanks hey, Mark, for. No, no, thanks, thanks to both me of you. On track. <laughs> no, no, it's you know. It's it's the worst. I don't, know, I don't want to be on the side of the police. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, but, um, but but, I mean, if, of course, it's a good thing because in a way, you, you talk about four projects, but. There are many, many projects that the two of you have worked on together, but also projects by your colleagues and so on. In, in a sense, this is today is just a kind of, let's say, a taste of the way you are thinking and, and, and working for, for now more than 20 years. So it's really, you've done enough work that you can then say, well, okay, how was that? Uh, how are we doing? And, and so maybe the, we, could, you and, we could have a little conversation, the three of us, in, in, in that spirit, like a little bit uh, looking back on 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 where you're at and what you're thinking and what you see as the kind of urgencies for the field. And I, I'm encouraging the audience to throw questions into the Q&A, which we may or may not be able to get to. But I think if you think of those as like letters to Father Christmas or something, not being sure if anybody will open them, but send them anyway, uh, I think we can figure out a way in which your voices are heard and that, and that Jan and Benjamin get a chance to, to uh, uh, respond. But a couple of things, I suppose, more or less obvious. It must be sort of boring the way people react to your work and probably almost always say the same things. And I will be the same, probably. But I'm struck by, of course, the, the, the obvious resonances in your work with 
you know, some names of the 60s and 70s. I am thinking Archie Graham, House Rooker Co., Bucky Fuller, Jonah Friedman, Cedric Price, Constant Niemannhausen, and so on. So there, there's this sort of a gang, we could say, or we could imagine that they were some kind of cooperative. After all, they were all being published in the same magazines, listening to each other and influencing each other. So we could imagine there was a kind of cooperative of experimental, maybe we can't call them architects, maybe anti-architects, or uh, architects who were calling on architect architecture to take responsibility for its various crimes. Uh, therefore, maybe the, the species had to change. And it seems, it seems there's a lot of the spirit of that work uh, in your work. And that's not just there, you almost, I would say, flaunt it. You almost say, look, here we go again. Uh, uh, but with a difference, maybe, because it seems to me that what you bring from the, that earlier wave of experiments, which were also highly political in the sense of those times, times of a, of, of, of a kind of proto-revolutions and so on, and, and the first perception of kind of global crises, maybe, but they were, they were very much experts in kind of thinking about air and water and energy and information and kind of metabolism, how all those things might be somehow inseparable. And uh, so a kind of ec ecological mindset, even if each of them had a very different uh, politics. And it, to my mind, almost your work uh, continues that experiment, but with, with some kind of crucial differences. It seems to me, firstly, you get into the ground. Uh, whereas almost all of that earlier work landed like a space, kind of came to the site from the future, let's say. Uh, and it seems to me your work almost does the opposite. It seems to come or it pretends to come out of the site. So in a certain way, it comes from the past. It, com it comes from the resources, uh, like what's the ground itself, but also people, labor, history, technology, contracts, and so on. It's kind of uh, a, a pulling pulling up from below a little bit versus this other thing coming down from above. But when I say ground, I speak very loosely, right? Because ground we normally think of as very solid and sort of standing still, but it's never that, right? Ground is what we together invent. It's what we make. That's why I love this expression, the common ground. It's a kind of common production and it's primarily liquid. So this is the, let's say, the first kind of comment that, that so we have, uh, let's say, uh, a, a lot of what we remember from the 60s, but now it really is liquid. It's not just kind of uh, image of liquid. It's really uh, liquids in all, all, all the projects. We could look again at the statistics project to see if it's also uh, uh, liquid. Maybe also the other thing that's added is a much more kind of um, intravenous uh, particip participation process. Like not only did the previous experiments kind of land from some sort of ideal future up in the air in the age of, you know, it was the age of the space race and, and so on. So landing like a kind of uh, a capsule. Uh, also in this case, it seems like you almost insist on, on a kind of very multi-dimensional long-term local collaboration, and I would hesitate to use the word community because I think community is also something that's constantly made. It's not simply existing or, or maybe a lot of what you do is kind of community uh, making. So I guess my first question is just oh, and maybe one last thing. Obviously, <laughs> so obvious I shouldn't say it, but you bring from the 60s pleasure, like play, uh, performance. So there was something kind of theatrical also. And, and I, I guess I want to ask you about the politics of that, because it seems to me, and of course, you know, I love it. So, so and somehow I've been in there and, and was one of the victims of the floating university project with, with Beatrice and our students from Columbia and Princeton. And I completely love this re-channeling of an earlier moment, a different kind of thinking about utopia or a different kind of uh, lo logic. Um, but it seems to me there may be, is there a kind of politics to this? That is to say, your work uh, doesn't appear to be so threatening because it seems to be festival-like, performance-like. It, it, it flaunts its smallness, its temporariness, its resourcefulness. And, and it does this in a certain sense let you get away with stuff because in a way people are letting you in uh, to these kind of acupuncture points in the urban fabric that they would not necessarily let you in if you were 
wearing the more traditional cap of the architect and being with solidity and, and coming, let's say, from the future. Like, in other words, are you kind of tricked in that sense that you pretend to be a little bit um, non-threatening? It's, it's sort of, to my mind, it's sort of like, a, again, it's a, fr it's a friendly revolution, right? It's a sort of, uh, everybody's enjoying themselves so much that they don't realize that they have been revolutionized. Does that make sense? I, yeah, I would say a lot of the things you say I can totally relate to. I mean, we have done this exhibition that was called Bye Bye Utopia. And what we were talking about in this exhibition was very much the fact that we are all kind of relying on this possibility of imagination that we were seeing in the 60s. And we were seeing this going away into uh, an architecture that was mostly glorifying the past and this is very specific for Berlin but maybe you could say the the ideal the our ideal of the city today is the 19th century city with some towers downtown and I mean this is what we're all doing and and we were depressed by that that this should be after being at amazing architecture schools like Cooper Union mm -hmm. that we sit there and we should draw like facades you know stone facades in berlin uh, there was a lot of jobs available when we finished with our study to to do this kind of jobs and we just wanted to go on yeah working with our imagination but in the same time i think we started by doing so we started re to realize that that there's no outside anymore and i think this happened in the moment or looking back i would interpret that it happened in the moment for us when the wall was coming down that until then we were always growing up with these lefty parents and we were always thinking we would definitely live in a very total different future you know maybe we would live on a greek island or maybe we would finally make a kind of socialist revolution but we would not live in this boring german kind of society with our boring parents like that was clear like we all wanted yeah. to be rock stars and we all wanted to be different and we wanted this very strong imagination but then by this glorious feast of the world coming down and us being able to expand into all this space in the city that got reunioned there was also this kind of imagination of the other or the outside was slowly disappearing and we realized by the smartphone and upcoming of google images and so that there was only this one world and that this one world is actually under a big threat and i think yeah. this is where this uh utopia idea hits the local uh, <laughs> Or the local is hit by the global that's the funny thing because the local is always difficult struggling is practice i mean all these projects they look nice and easy but they all struggle and conflict and 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 so on and so forth and uh but 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 then i think this gets even now much more conflicted by that you always have to think global and i i would also say that this is where this kind of happiness that we also try to produce uh, becomes almost like an essential tool or condition huh? that that we yeah, yeah. that we work within this struggle and we are able to stay within the struggle and not to escape because we also make ourselves a kind of community or we make ourselves. Uh, look after each other in a way and yeah we i mean, think i think this hap this uh, happiness thing is important because you look at people who win the pritzker prize they all look like they have a severe case of stomach uh, uh problems you know so basically the 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 image the classic image of the architect is somebody suffering um so this amazing combination of uh, uh uber arrogance uh, I can solve every problem, and I am suffering for every, everyone. So, just the idea of uh, of a happy architect is already, let's say, a revolution in the idea of the architect. But maybe to go to your point about about the like the cell phones and stuff. And I'm speaking too fast, and and you you think about this stuff seriously. So we we have a small small kind of conversation. But again, the 60s, 
if I listen to the language of the architects in that time, it's not so different from the language of the Silicon Valley uh, sort of utopia of com communication. So, so, and there is in, in almost all of the radical architects or anti-architects of the 60s, some kind of concept of radical democracy liberated by technology, that there would be equal access to the ability to communicate. And if we can communicate, then we don't really need politicians because we become the new political order. That, that language gets echoed by Silicon Valley and is used, of course, in its, in its kind of empires of micro extraction, literally out of our brains, right? So this idealized utopian uh, quasi-revolutionary discourse about radical democracy actually became the agent of kind of a big brother extraction system. So again, I think when 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 pointing to the fact that your work resonates so strongly with uh, with and so happily, let's say, with the kind of fun palace, let's say in Cedric Price's terms, or fun palace logic, there is a kind of a separation being made here um, politically, and it turns on this local global thing because. I think, for example, you've got a lot of architects watching you today because, and I see from the chat, they're really curious about whether or not this is a kind of a model that could be used, for example, in the United States. Several people are asking questions like, could that work, like, you know, in the in the belly of the beast here in the United States, let's say. Um, and I think, you know, as a, as a kind of beginning of talking about this, I think this this obsession with the local immediately uh, becomes global once you think in a kind of, in terms of, met, of metabolism, every local site is absolutely linked to vast global situations. Like I think what's so beautiful when you show that, that the brick factory is in one corner of the town, but actually the whole town is made from those bricks. And if we do a similar analysis of even the most simple building on our planet, almost every building is taking resources from other parts of the planet and there's a lot of suffering, a lot of extraction and a lot of exploitation all the way into the building to make the building. And then the building itself assists those logics. So in other words, the word local seems to me, and I'm asking this as a question, I guess, is kind of like an acupuncture point into kind of global flows that are often super, super unjust, right? So it seems to me just to present you like in a comic book as kind of heroes and heroines, you 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 adjust the plumbing at these acupuncture points fully in the knowledge that that plumbing extends, let's say, globally. So I actually don't buy the claim that you guys work are really is really that local. I think it's super global and super ambitious in its you know uh, possible influence, which is why so many of us find ourselves part of this uh, spider's web. But also, and you were hinting at that in the last project, that the top-down, bottom-up thing is getting confused now because in a certain sense, you your work is no longer so small or so temporary. It seems to get bigger and scale gets bigger and you start to sound like planners. And 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 uh, I guess I'm wondering, like, is, does this feel like you're slipping over into the system or is this a continued, and of course you don't want to say yes to that, but is it a continuation of the kind of subversion that if one thinks radically about the local, one ends up infiltrating every corner of the of the operation? Benjamin, what do you think? I, Are you a hero or a villain? I, I think, yes, we're slipping over, partly. Yeah. Because um, we're, we're, we're seeing the necessity of, of getting even more uh, serious. But um, at the same time, we are, uh, um, I think the, the, the Cedric Price blood is still pumping through our veins too much <laughs> to, uh, to completely give up with that. So we are, we are, we are constantly um trying to uh, infiltrate these uh these uh bureaucratic processes with um with things like the pioneer process right the pioneer right. process of the house statistic is a process to bring life into uh, a, a structure before the transformation actually happens to uh to get the get these ideas of the people and of the people that would use this uh, in, into the process. And this is also what's happening in Temple of, this is happening, what, uh, that, that's what we're doing with the, with the floating university because still it is 
uh, development uh, area that we are in. Well, it's not over. The discussion, the, the, new, uh, the new government of Berlin seems to be black and red, uh, meaning the socialists and the <laughs> West Democrats getting together. And they yeah. will discuss the discussion of building loft housing in places like that again. So we have to bring these examples and these examples are there to also um, to build up a lobby and to build um, to to have a lot of people who know that uh, there's different possibilities for the future than just um, that than just that side. But I, I want to one little thing that I would like to elaborate on, and this is the aspect of landing. I think you're not completely right with the idea that the, that the 60s were just you know flying in like um like uh ufos from from outer space um, and and yes there were these ideas but one of the projects that we are always referring to is the instant city and the instant city is exactly this idea of something that an idea basically coming in with a lot of with a lot of um uh, uh, creativity and also a team and 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 it's it's a bit more like a circus coming to town that is trying to infiltrate the existing uh, the existing system uh, to also make something that is sustainable and that stays and that's changing. May, yes, maybe in the instant city that story is still saying that uh, that the information uh, technology is coming in, but it's also uh, a, a um, a very, um, uh, very analog way of changing the city. Right, this right. Is... But I, I would say, I know we're running out of time, but it's, that's, I mean, what does it mean anyway? Time is a resource, but but Instant City, for, it's a good example for me because Instant City is always every time the same. Wherever it travels, it looks more or less the same. There are some balloons and some bubbles. But if I look at Realm Labor, it's never the same. Is really every project, uh, of course, if you, once you're tuning into it, you go, you might say to yourself, oh, yeah, uh, it's like graffiti. Ram Labor has tagged that city. It's doing its thing. But its thing is never quite the same. And I think this is the difference. Because you hook yourself into the, into the plumbing system of a situation, intellectually, physically, contractually, legally, and so on, what you produce turns all, always out to kind of look different. And therefore, in a way, uh, the generosity of your project is almost to say that the gift here is not really coming from Ram Labor, but coming from the situation, that there is something a little bit repressed in the current situation that is relatively efficiently uh, unlocked. If you can be savvy with resources, but also with people and organizations and so on, right? Whereas the Archigram presents itself as a, as a chocolate box that always it's the same set of chocolates every time that, that you open up and it doesn't really hit the ground. And when it leaves, the ground is the same, right? So, and remember, Instant City is held up on balloons, right? So it even, it doesn't really like the ground. Uh, it might, might, might not even like humans, you know, it might, might not. And I'm not saying we should like humans, perhaps the most despicable species on our planet, right? So I think the whole idea of a human-centered architecture sounds like a crime in the in the in the making, but maybe just if we could extend, because we're going to go over time, I know a little bit. Something else with Cedric Price that's so strong, it seems to me, in the work is education, right? Fun Palace, of course, was a university. And I, I was just wondering a little to hear from you in, in the sense of why it's always education and every single project, and it's never one kind of education, it's education in, in, in multiple senses and multiple words. You, you use words like laboratory, school, university, and all these things. But if you look at it, it, almost every one of your projects is some kind of uh, educational system, like some kind of brain, um, you know, sort of an operation on brains more than an operation on everything else. And it's just, you know, curious about that. I think even in terms of the last project that, Jan, you didn't get a chance to fully explain, but the House of Statistics, you know, was getting into people's brains. I mean, this was the sort of center of, a kind of calculation of how people's mentality and how lifestyle would work. So for you to enter that space and to, as in a way, generate alternative forms of education within that, um, absolutely kind of the very image of, of a kind of uh, big brother, that's not even an image, it was, was big brother, right? Um, why, why, why 
uh, always education. And, and, and I guess I'm just trying to say, maybe it's a final question to you. I'm a teacher, right? That's what I do. So, and I, I like teachers and I like what you guys do. So I like to think that you're just teachers. That's what you are. Is it true that you are, you only in a way design in order to teach? Right. I, I start and then I give the word to you, Jan. I, I try to take, make it short. I think it's for, going to be the last word. Yeah. With, uh, with the notion of, of landing and uh, landing more in the Bruno Latour way of actually arriving on this planet and, and, and understanding the planet. And I think this is something that we, we, we come from the 70s. We're, we're still flying in. We still think that. Um, that uh, things can, you know, that that our mobile phones can can help us, and uh, and and somehow we we have to find out we have to find this out together. And we are we, I think we are creating these learning and unlearning situations because we have the feeling ourselves that we want to learn and unlearn uh, where we are and what are the right ways to to act and how to how we get all these big uh topics um how we how we find solutions to the big questions right jan yeah yeah maybe i can only add to this that i have a lot of frustrations when it comes to this like you are in this discussions and then everything is so complex huh? and there's okay this mm. is so complex and i have the feeling that many things that we think we cannot really decide about or act about like if we would just give us two days and we, in a group of relatively intelligent people, we get very close to a solution. And I think we try to create very often this situation that we get make people stuck in a place and stick together and stick uh, thinking about these problems that are there, uh, that, that are the same problems anyways as all over the place. But then in this place, you can maybe act up on these problems. And so I see it as a school, but also as a kind of uh, civic society that has to be able to yeah like to 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 make critic but really precise critic to to push the government to be critical and so on and so forth uh, uh, as the only chance of a kind of collective learning that can uh, that can handle this enormous change that we have in front of us especially in terms of building and and the city and uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, I, I completely love your um, description of what you're doing. I, if I, what I treasure in it is is maybe the, if the, if we are discussing a, a change in a, a sort of shift in the sensibility or the mode of operation of architects, this idea that you just said that you try to get people stuck in a place, basically so they share ideas. And then maybe from this something changes, behavior changes, action changes. This, this is kind of a different ambition for architects, simply to get people stuck in places. I think of the swimming pool that is also a meeting place. So you're there for pleasure and you find yourself in a space of, of constructing community to think together, to make decisions together and so on. I think this, this sort of, it's a much more important ambition for architects, uh, it seems to me, than almost anything else to create a certain a hospitality that makes people linger linger for longer than would be normal, maybe with with other people and other animals and species longer than would be normal, just to get stuck. Uh, I, I think there could be schools of there could be courses in schools of architecture on how to make people get stuck for a while. <laughs> uh, but in that spirit, it was a lot of fun to be stuck with you here um, in Zoom. And again, I'm sorry to the audience of fellow architects that didn't really get a chance to get their questions through, but I, hopefully we, we will figure out a way to do that. And thanks to the league and, and Mario for, for helping, but more than anything else, um, you know, good luck for the next 20 years. And then we, we will do a diagnostic test in 20 years. See you, everybody. Thanks everybody for yeah. joining. Thank you, Mark. Come by, come back to Berlin. Yeah, will do. Will do. Fantastic.